Thank you very much indeed for being here. Thanks for joining me, Ben Makin, on your Thursday morning science and celebrity breakfast show here on Source FM. Another cracking show lined up for you today. Plenty of special guests for you. My first guest this morning, and I'm absolutely delighted about this. He's a fantastic, fantastic man. And that is Dr. Barry Fitzgerald. Barry is a research scientist, originally a physicist actually by training. He's a research scientist, but also, and perhaps more importantly for today, he's a science communicator and an author. He's got two of these uh, very popular science books, which you might have come across already, Secrets of Superhero Science and The Secret Science of Santa Claus. Now, we're going to be talking about those a bit today. He's a self-acclaimed superhero enthusiast, Okay, He says... Around the age of five or six, he saw Superman for the first time. And then ever since then, apparently, he just thought, you know what? I want superpowers and I want superpowers as soon as possible. Then, of course, through his training in science, he actually began to think, I believe. I I must be right thinking this. He began to think, actually, you know what? Superpowers could really be a reality using our own technology, using science, essentially, using the tool of science. So he actually essentially explores this in this book uh, and he you know, uses super superheroes like Spider-Man and Hawkeye, talks about their technology, talks about their superpowers and wonders whether they're possible. So it's pretty cool stuff, OK? So he's on the show today, actually, to tell us about a fantastic competition. I'm delighted to hear this is still going. We had a, a brilliant guest before on the show chatting about this. Um, and this is the Young Imagineers competition. Young people between 7 and 14, ages of 7 and 14, can get involved with this. And all they have to do, so this is fantastic. If you know anyone of this age, or if you're perhaps a teacher, or if you know a teacher, this is great to tell them. Uh, Any parents out there too, get them aware of this, because the closing date is this Sunday. So we've got to be quick. But all you have to do is send in an idea that you think can change the world for the better. Okay, so get that into this competition. It's going to be fantastic. So that's Barry Fitzgerald. He's up first. Delighted about that. We also have the fabulous, the dangerously handsome, Dr. Ranj. Yes, Dr. Ranj is on the show. He's a dancer, of course. We all know that. Yeah, well, he's on the show a bit later. He's actually got a quick update about flu for us. So, you know what? We thought, well, what better man than Dr. Ranj himself to give us that little announcement. So he's there. So look forward to that. Look forward to that. We also have the return of our very own professor, Professor Dave Hoskin, on the show today. Today, he is answering the questions. This is a question that you guys put to him. And you can always do this as well. Just get your questions uh, to me. I will put it to the profs and we'll see what they come up with. Makes for great radio, so make sure you do that. Uh, Today, he's actually answering the question, how do scientists see evolution happening? How do we observe evolution? How do we know it's occurring? Well, Dave will answer all. I also get the daft question to him. So each week I try and choose a silly question as well and uh, get that to him too. So if you've got a silly question, it doesn't have to be a serious question. It can be a silly question. Get that to me as well. And I'll, I'll ask Dave and Sasha. Dave is on the show solo today talking about this. So that's fantastic. We also have a, a mathematician on the show, Bobby Siegel. You might know him from University Challenge. Bit of a star, actually, Bobby is. Bit of an up-and-coming uh, TV presenter as well. Pretty awesome. He's talking about another competition, actually, for kids. So this is awesome. A couple of competitions to tell you about today um all about education which is awesome uh they're actually looking for the national young mathematicians of the year and this is with uh, explore learning so this is pretty cool so we'll be talking to bobby a bit later i also and i'm gonna have to say this didn't go so well this part of the interview i thought it'd be great to start with some maths jokes and you know as you as you all know i'm a bit of a comedian so i thought that would go really well it didn't he didn't, it didn't enjoy my maths jokes but you know what <sighs> you know I just didn't think I could edit that out. I've left it in. So we'll see. We'll see. You'll see how that goes for yourself, OK? Don't go anywhere because we're going to kick straight off with Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, my fantastic first guest today. Thursday breakfast on Source FM. Ben, how are you? Hello, Barry. Yeah, very well, thanks. Very well indeed. Well, thanks for chatting me today. This is awesome. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. That's great. If you're all good to go, Barry, could I just first allow you to introduce yourself? Because can I just say your area is just the coolest thing ever. So I'd just love to <laughs> give yourself an intro, basically, if that's all right. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Barry Fitzgerald, and I am a superhero scientist. 
No, that is cool. Yeah, that, awesome. I mean, I'd, I'd love to chat about this a bit, lo- a bit more, really, but we won't because we haven't got too much time this morning. But I just, I just love to chat to you for ages. Because I mean, I, I noticed one of the things that's taken your attention before is um, CRISPR Cas genome editing, which I, I actually had the pleasure of working on CRISPR Cas with my old supervisor, Dr. Westra. Um, we were kind of looking at the ecology of the system, though, not the uh, genome editing side to things. But I think it's awesome there are people out there like like yourself, basically encouraging encouraging the general public to get interested in things like that. Yeah, CRISPR-Cas is actually one of the one of the latest uh, uh, sci- scientific discoveries that I promote when I'm doing uh, workshops, presentations, yes. and uh, I have to say that it's uh, it's a fascinating technology. And and any time I do a presentation for children, they absolutely love the possibilities you could uh, that could be made could happen with CRISPR-Cas. I just think it's amazing as well. I mean, obviously, we won't spend too too long chatting about this, but I think it's absolutely amazing that. You know, for for kids, having people like yourself talking to them and telling them about things like this, I mean, it just sounds so sci-fi, doesn't it? But it just, you know, it just must be a remarkable telling these kids, no, this is real science. You know, we have this technology. It's amazing. But, and the great thing about it is that it's in its infancy. So when I talk to, when you talk to children, you're talking to the next generation. They're the ones who are going to have the possibility to yes. bring it forward to the next stage, something that... I, I probably can't even imagine something that you can't even imagine, and they're going to get the opportunity to do that. And that's what's most exciting, from my perspective, for them, that they're the ones who are going to be doing it. Oh, absolutely fantastic. Well, I mean, you know, very, very on, on topic here. Let's chat about the uh, Young Imagineers competition. Delighted to see this is uh, running again. I actually had the pleasure of chatting to Ms. Patel um, last time. So, this, yeah, this is awesome that it's still going. Yeah, it's a fantastic competition, the Young Imagineers competition, which has been presented by Equinar. It's a, it's a really, really innovative approach to get children between the ages of 7 and 14 years old involved in STEM and thinking about developing inspiring approaches and inspiring new ideas that could be beneficial to society of the future. Fantastic. Uh, just thinking about um, kids getting involved with this and, and looking at the research that's kind of been released alongside this, this is really encouraging. I mean, I see here that actually a load of these kids are really enjoying STEM. That's fantastic. Oh, it's fantastic to see in, in the survey. So as part of the Young Imagineers competition, there was a survey done with a number of children, 1,000 children, and the, the top subjects were maths and science. And as a scientist... Um, and as a researcher, I find that really, really, really fascinating, comforting to see that, that, that children are fascinated by the STEM subjects and really want to push forward and move forward with them. Fantastic. And coming back to the, uh, the, the competition itself, um, I think this is great. Basically, you're encouraging, aren't you, um, children, as you said, between the ages of 7 and 14, to basically come up with an idea that will help the world at large, help the, make the world a better place, and basically submit these ideas uh, to, the, to the competition to be judged. Exactly, yeah. So it's a very easy process. What the children can do is they can they can go online, they can go to the youngimagineers.equinar.com, they can download the application form. All you need to do is draw a picture of your inspiring invention or inspiring idea, have 100 words, and you can submit then the uh, the application but before October 21st. And uh, the winner, it's a fantastic prize, the winner will get to see their invention turn into a model and placed in the Wonder Lab Equinar Gallery at the Science Museum. I think it's a great, great prize. Fantastic. So you get to see the invention, you know, almost for real, just there in front of you. I think that's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to, to have their, their own dreams and their ideas become a reality and to be able to say, look, I've, I'm, I came up with this and here it is right in front of me. So, Barry, thinking about uh, kids getting involved with this, is this something that you would encourage um, kids to get involved with via schools, so for teachers, or can or can parents help the kids, uh, you know, get online and do this themselves, or how would you how would you you know invite them to do this best? I think there are, both approaches you just mentioned there are very good. Either you can do it together with your fellow with the, with their fellow students in the classroom, along with their teacher, and maybe they can get inspiration for the ideas for their for a particular entry, or they could do it with their parents. Like, for example, last year's winner, Finlay, his, his idea was inspired by the world that he lives in, the world that, he, that he's surrounded by, and the people that are important to him. And he came up with uh, an ingenious hovering wheelchair, which he felt was something that could be a benefit to, benefit to both his grandmother and his aunt, both who have mobility issues. And he thought this invention was something that could really make a difference to their world, and as a result, to make a difference to his world. So Fantastic. maybe the students will get inspiration at school, maybe they get inspiration when working with their parents, but either approach, I think, is a very good way to, to, to put together a really cool um, um, entry for the competition. That's awesome. Finley, what, what a legend. I mean, that's, that's such an awesome thing to be thinking about. I mean, it just shows, not only does it show imagination, but I think it just shows just uh, an inherent kindness to it as well. I think that's fantastic. But that's, 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 
actually it's fantastic to see that. And actually, one of the other other questions in the survey was about how how we can make the world a better place. And the t- the, the the big answer was fifty percent was about trying to have enough food in the world, which is yes. just showing the selfless and 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 the dedicated approach that children have and and looking at trying to make the world a better place, uh, which is it's very very uh, for me is great to see, to be honest. And Barry, I hope you don't mind. I'd, I'd just really like to uh, just maybe spend a couple of minutes, if, if that's OK with you, just ch- chatting about yourself for a second and thinking about, you know, your involvement with science and where, you know, where you started out, really. And just I, th- I think it's a great thing to talk about, for, uh, perhaps any particularly any young people, of course, listening in, um, listening to you on the show today. But I just I just don't know whether we could just chat a little bit about that, you know, your own uh, kind of journey through science. And, and, and now, of course, you're, you're involved with all these fantastic communication work as well. Yeah, so I, I, what I started out was I did a degree in applied physics uh, back. In, I'm from Ireland, I'm from Limerick, so I did it at the University of Limerick, and then uh, I did a PhD in uh, in com- computational physics, where I wrote computer models to try and simulate the real world. Um, I'm now currently a researcher based in the Netherlands. I work at uh, the Delft University of Technology, but as I was working through my my scientific research career, I started to develop an interest in scientific communication and outreach. And, on t- and as a result of that, then I started to get interested in superhero science. So I've written, uh, I've written a book about superheroes and the science behind them. I've written scientific papers about them. Um, and, and as I said at the start, I really love the opportunity to go and talk about the possibilities for science. Because what I put forward is not, is not the answer, it's my answer. And secondly, uh, secondly, what I think is really important, it gives me the opportunity to inspire the next generation to, to think about how they can get involved, how they can uh, make a difference to, to the STEM subjects, and uh, what, what, what they could create that's missing from the world of today to have in the world of tomorrow. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Barry. I mean, I, I think you, you, your kind of idea of, you know, taking superheroes and, and, and using those, you know, using ideas from, from comic books and, and films and things to, to illustrate you know, real science. I think that's absolutely fantastic because, of course, so many people are, and, and particularly kids as well, of course, are, are so interested in things, in things that they see in films and, and in comic books, and and just seeing the kind of real science surrounding that. It's it's, it's it's amazing. Absolutely. Like I'm sure that everybody would like to have a superpower of some sort, and and perhaps hope um, that scientists will actually create it. But what what I try and put forward is that. Um, that the idea is that while scientists are trying to um, are not actually actively creating superpowers, what they're doing is they're working on advanced science and engineered techniques that could make the world a better, safer, and healthier place. And once we do that, I think it would be great to to maybe perhaps have superpowers on sale in stores, maybe invisibility cloaks and, yes. <laughs> and uh, maybe uh, uh, Iron Man type suits that everyone could buy and that they're safe. But I think that the technology and the, and the innovation we should be looking at is to 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 uh, to make the world a better, safe and healthier place. And for the Young, Young Imagineers competition, we're hoping to see uh, um, entries that, that reflect that, to make a positive difference in the world of tomorrow. Hey, Barry, you know what I'm going to have to ask you now? If you could pick any superpower, what, what would you pick? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, it's very difficult for me because I, I watch these films religiously. I've seen, like, The Avengers more than 60 times. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, and <laughs> every time I watch them, I, my, I, or a film, my, my favourite power changes. But... At the moment, currently, the one I would really like to have is advanced eyesight, just like Hawkeye from the Avengers, oh. because he has uh, exceptional eyesight to the extent that he can track two objects at the same time, that he can zoom in with his eyesight on particular objects. His eyes are very similar to that of Birds of Prey, and at the moment, currently, and it probably will change, that's the one I would really like to have right now. Oh, fantastic. Well, it's a, it's a great answer. Thanks, Barry. And uh, I'd just really love to, uh, of course, I'm aware of your time, won't keep for much longer now. I'd love just to really um, head towards closing up and really just reiterate where we can send our listeners to, if that's okay, to just, you know, just to become a bit more aware of the competition. And of course, being aware of the closing date, which you were saying, of course, is coming up. So people need, do need to get involved quickly, don't they? Absolutely. So the, the Young Imagineers competition, closing date is on October 21st. Um, you can if you're interested in entering, you can download an entry form from youngimagineers.equinart.com. For the entry, all you need to do is have a sketch of your invention, your inspiring idea, with 100 words about that particular idea, and then you can send them through online. And uh, the top 10 then will be picked to compete in the final, which will take place at the Wonder Lab at Science Museum on November 24th. I've seen some of the entries already. They really are inspiring. And it's very clear to me already that many of the entries are, are looking at the world around them for inspiration for an inspiring 
brand new technology that could make a real difference in the future. Fantastic. Thanks, Barry. And Barry, i just really like to give you a song choice now, if that's all right with you. I mean, I can play anything you like. It could even be the Avengers theme tune, but I'm going to leave it to you. Would you like me to play <laughs> something? <laughs> Um, I don't know. That's a, uh, what's. I don't even know if I have a favorite superhero kind of um, <laughs> so song funny. or related song. Yeah, I think actually, you know what? Let's go with the Avengers theme. Yeah, that yeah, sounds like a really good, uh, a good really good choice. Yeah, I, I support that. Yeah, the kind of epic version from the latest one, Infinity War, as well. It's you know, the, you know what I mean. The kind of really orchestral version. The brah, 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 brah. I'll get that one on. Is that all right? Ex- uh, sounds fantastic. That's really good. <laughs> I, I I support and endorse that choice. Okay, well, great. Well, thanks so much, Barry. I will now let you go, unless of course there's anything you wanted to add or anything that I might have missed at all. Just just checking you're happy, basically. I think we've I think we've covered everything. Yes. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much, Barry. I shall let you go then, and thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Ben. A pleasure to speak to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Barry. Bye now. Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, thanks very much. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show, people. Please do check out his book, Secrets of Superhero Science, as well. If you want to learn a bit more about that, about his area, I think it's absolutely fantastic. He's also, as I said, a research scientist. So he's an awesome guy. Check him out. And don't forget to get involved with the Young Imagineers competition, open to those between the ages of 7 and 14, with a closing date of this Sunday. So get involved! For now, just soak up this theme tune. Thanks very much, Barry. Pleasure to have you on the show. Now, coming up next, then, today is Dr. Ranch. Yes, it's Dr. Ranch. Everybody's favourite medical doctor, Dr. Ranch. Definitely the suavest medical doctor. I don't know. I mean, I don't know about you, but if you... I mean, surely you know what Dr. Ranch looks like. But if you don't, I mean, woohoo! He is a suave man. So he's on the show today to give us actually a quick update on flu vaccines. So hope this is of interest to any of you listening. Straight after this, we are going to continue with the show. Going to invite my next special guest in. We're going to get another cheeky request on as well. So don't you worry. As always, of course, if you want to get a request to me, you can do that, and I will be delighted to play your tunes. Don't worry about it. Pop me a message. You know the score. Find me on Facebook. Do do whatever. Go on the Source FM website. All my contact details are on there. You can find me there, or you can text me directly if you like on oh seven eight six zero six seven zero nine one seven and tell me what you want to hear, and I'll get it straight on for you. Maybe you're. So tell me what superpower you'd pick. Yeah? Barry picked a superpower there. What would you pick? I don't know. Perhaps. Perhaps. The coolest answer could get a, a, a chilli sauce, maybe. So my homemade chilli sauce. Famous homemade chilli sauce. You know, it kind of sounds like I'm trying to get rid of this, doesn't it? I do try and give this away on the show sometimes. But I'll cook you your own personal batch of red hot chilli sauce. How about that? That could be a good prize for that. Anyway, yeah, let's not detract from the real competition, the Young Imagineers competition. Check that out. But for now, I think I'm going to get Dr. Ran straight on the show. Hope you enjoy this, people. Thursday breakfast on Source FM. I was going to say, it's great to have a famous dancer. Oh, I mean doctor on the show. <laughs> How are you doing? You okay? <laughs> I'm good, thank you very much. Excellent. Well, I'm really, really pleased to be here, actually, to uh, yeah, to talk, chat to us about the flu and hopefully, yeah, get parents up to speed this season. So that's awesome. Thanks for this. And let's just talk about the difference between cold and flu, if you don't mind, because, I mean, I, it looks here, you know, I've got this survey in front of me from AstraZeneca, yeah. actually, and actually a lot of parents seem to think that it's basically just a bad cold, but actually I'm yeah. sure you can tell us that there's some differences there. Yeah, a recent surveys show that just over half of parents think that flu is just like a bad cold. In fact, colds and flu are both caused by viruses, but they're very different viruses. And flu can be much more serious, both in terms of the symptoms that it can cause. So it can give you high fever, aches and pains, extreme tiredness, sore throat and dry cough, which are all unpleasant, but also in terms of the complications that can result. It can lead to things like bronchitis, pneumonia, and even land you in hospital. And many parents don't realise that children under the age of five are the most at-risk group in terms of ending up in hospital because of the flu. And that's why we are so keen on parents and carers getting their children vaccinated against flu every year. And this is something which actually a lot of kids can get for free, isn't it? Yep, so uh, currently the NHS offers a nasal spray flu vaccination programme to all children um, in England, that's all children that are aged two and three, and all children that are in school up until year five. It's slightly different for Wales, Ireland and uh, Scotland, 
Um, and if you want to know uh, exactly what the protocol is for your region, you can either speak to your healthcare professional or go to AstraZeneca's website, which is sharegoodtimesnotflu.co.uk. Obviously, if you're not eligible for the nasal spray vaccination, if it's not suitable for you, then there is still the alternative injectable type as well. Fantastic. And uh, Dr. Ranger, I hope you don't mind, but just um, you know, on the topic of the nasal spray vaccine, I wonder if you could kind of run us through this a little bit. I don't know whether this is something that you know, some of our listeners might not have come across before, mm. maybe they haven't researched it very much. I wonder if you could kind of run us through this. Yeah, there's still a lot of misunderstanding around how the nasal spray flu vaccine works. In fact, around 60% of parents still misunderstand that. Basically, it contains a weakened form of the flu virus. So what it does, it still stimulates your child's immune system to detect and fight the virus, similar to like a, a natural infection would, but it doesn't cause flu. So it's far better than getting flu itself. Fantastic. I'm just thinking as well if there's anything, any other um, you know, obvious things that you could give for tips for parents. I mean, of course, it sounds like uh, one thing to do that they could do straight away really is just um, is read up on it and perhaps as well check, you know, um, whether their kids are going to get the vaccine through school or, or whatever and, and maybe just be in the know. Yeah, so lots of parents will have questions about the vaccination and whether their child is eligible. And I'm supporting AstraZeneca's Share Good Times Not Flu campaign. And as part of that, there is a website they can go to for more information. And that is sharegoodtimesnotflu.co.uk. And I've also done a little film on there where I'm chatting to mummy vlogger Emily Norris, which has got lots of information in it as well. Oh, that's great. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Ranch. I th- really appreciate that. Um, Thank you. I'd just like to uh, just double check, really, if there's anything else at all that you could, um, you know, that you would like to get across to parents at all at the moment. I mean, I know you've, you've given us some great advice and thanks for that and filled us in on the vaccine itself and point listeners in the direction of further information. But I'm just double checking. I've covered everything, basically. Yeah, I think a lot of parents might have uh, questions about side effects and the mo- the most common side effects are things like blocked or runny nose or cold-like symptoms. And what I stress to parents is that that is much better than getting flu itself and flu can be far riskier. And therefore, um, we continue to recommend that they get the flu vaccination if they're eligible. Fantastic. Now, Dr. Ranch, I hope this is OK, because I'd, I'd love to actually give you a song request for appearing on the show today. It's only <laughs> yeah. fair, and I don't, know, I don't know whether you're going to request Prince Ali at all, but you can. It's, it's up to you, totally up to you. <laughs> Do you know what I'd really like to, to request is a song that I'm going to be dancing to this week, and that is The Beach Boys' Wouldn't It Be Nice. Oh, what a choice. Thanks, Dr. Ranch. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, I must say it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I will now let you go, unless, of course, there is anything else at all that you wanted to add. I think that's everything, guys. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Ranch. I'll let you. you go then. Thanks for your time Take this care. morning. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Doctor. Did you catch? Did you catch him doing that? Doing that quick step to Prince Ali. Pretty awesome stuff. But thank you very much, Doctor Ange. And did you know that's the second time Doctor Ange has been on the show with us here on Source? How cool is that? A returning celeb. Pretty cool stuff. Anyway, if you're in any doubt at all as to any of that information that you've just heard there, then of course you are. You can always check with your health professional. Thank you very much. But for now, I'm afraid. I think it's time we should, we should probably get this song request on, shouldn't we, really? I think so. I'll tell you what, I'm going to have a little cheeky boogie in the studio to this one. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Let's get it on, shall we? Maybe I could be Dr. Ranger's dance partner. No. OK, moving on with the show then. I think, you know what? It's time to invite a mathematician to the show. Yep, it's time for Bobby Seagull to come on the show recently appointed ambassador for explore learning he's there today with the head of curriculum from explore learning charlotte uh, they're actually talking about this competition to find the national young mathematicians of the year so this is fantastic for any schools so let's get this straight on and i already did warn you at the beginning of the show about my bad math jokes um, i can only apologize for that but in the interest of you know being totally transparent i didn't edit that out so you know, just excuse the little start here, if you don't mind, but let's get it on for you, yeah. Um, so my name is Bobby Seagull, so I'm a part-time school math teacher, doing a doctorate at Cambridge. Um, listeners may know me from University Challenge or my recent road trip series, Monkman and Seagull's Gene Sky to Britain, and this year, I'm really excited that I'm an ambassador for Explore Learning. Thanks, Bobby. Um, and I'm Charlotte, and I'm the head of curriculum at the Explore Learning Nutrition Centre. Thanks, Charlotte. Fantastic. Now, I hope you both don't mind, but I, this morning I thought an appropriate way to kick off this interview, I've Googled rubbish maths jokes. Do you mind if I just tell you one of these? Is that all right? As long as you allow me to steal them in lessons in school. Of course. I'm not sure right. you'll want to because these are pretty bad. But, OK, let's fire away with this one. 
did you hear about the constipated mathematician's problem? No. He worked it out with a pencil. Uh... <laughs> How bad is that? That's terrible, isn't it? All right, okay, another one for you, another one for you, another one for you. Hang on, just one more for you. How many molecules in a bowl of guacamole? You ready? Avocado's yep. number. Oh, no, that's good. Oh, yeah, that's bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Should we, should we, should we start again? I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> so, Bobby, I'll start with you, if that's all right. I mean, you are obviously a man who is well known to love mathematics. And I can see this research in front of me here, uh, which, is, which is absolutely fantastic, actually. And I'm really keen to talk about this, uh, this competition you've got going as well. But, Bobby, can I start with you and just ask where your love of maths has come from? Yes. Um, so actually, it was from outside of the classroom. So as a child, I used to be really into football. I mean, still am, um, and particularly football stickers. And what I did was um, I got all the data from the football sticker book, so players' age, height, goals scored, left foot, right foot, penalties, put that into a database when I was eight or nine. And I found that when friends would have conversations about football, like they're saying, oh, Ian writes better than Matty Letizia. I could actually come back the next day having interrogated my spreadsheet and saying, well, actually, you'll find that Matty Letizia takes most of his goals from penalty kicks, 20% of his goals, so therefore Ian writes better from open player, open play. So I found that <laughs> mathematics gave me a um, point of confidence in my life. Like, if I, if I was good at numbers, it meant that, oh, I could tackle questions, discussions with, with a real uh, backing behind it. Oh, that's fantastic. And you know what, I think that, that actually comes in really nicely to some, uh, well, to some of these findings, actually, that you've, that you've, that you've got over on this, uh, on this survey, which is, which is great. I'll turn to you in a second, Charlotte, as well. But, and, and it's kind of just about, you know, maths, I think, comes up. I don't know whether you guys agree with this, but maths kind of comes up in areas where people aren't expecting it. So I think, you know, it's absolutely great to see well, that basically students are actually interested in math because, of course, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it, that I guess you always expect to see, if you, if you do a survey on anyone, you expect to see a lot of, you know, not, not a lot of confidence at all in, in maths in the general public. I think that's what you've, you're finding. But it, I think it's just one of those things, remember, isn't it, maths it crops up in all the places where you might not really think about it cropping up in. Yeah, I think it's, it's you get sort of like, two camps in school. You get some people that are confident in the maths and they really enjoy problem solving. They had good experience with numeracy at primary school. But we also get a significant minority who find maths challenging. That they, they almost have like that anxiety, you know, that racing heart, the sweaty palms when they do mathematics. And again, one of the reasons I'm really excited to be involved with this project, Explore Learning, is mathematics is obviously about, you, you know, you do need to get the right answer, but it's all about problem solving skills. And these are things that you do not just individually, but you do it in teams and pairs and groups of four. And, it, and in the real world, you're not doing things in isolation. You're doing things as part of projects, as part of group work. And maths, confidence in maths really helps you to think, oh, actually, I might be able to find an analytical way of solving this uh, problem. That's fantastic. It, you know, I think it's great for students to see it more as like this, as you're saying, like a collaborative thing, maths, not not something you have to kind of struggle with alone. But I mean, let's talk about this competition a bit more, because, I mean, this sounds absolutely fantastic, uh, you know, aimed, of course, aimed at school children across the UK. And I believe, basically, that the, the idea is to basically find the National Young Mathematicians of the Year, isn't it? And you, schools enter in these teams, as you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Um, and this year we're really excited we, that we've got a primary school competition, but for the first time we've actually got a secondary school competition as well. Brilliant. So children of different ages can get involved. Fantastic. So let's let's just mention briefly for our listeners, if that's right, how you know exactly how these schools can get involved. They you know can they can they do this online? Um, so there's two ways to um, get involved. We have the competition running in our Explore Learning Centres. Um, so the nearest one in your area is actually Bristol. So if they want a day trip out to Bristol, then they can get involved. Um, but we can also hold the event at a satellite school as well. So if there's a group of schools that want to get involved, then they can do it that way. And they can go to our website, which is explorelearning.co.uk forward slash young mathematicians. And all the information about how to get involved is on there. That's fantastic. And what about just any, um, I suppose, any tips for any schools or, or perhaps, you know, if a, if a teacher or a parent happens to hear this and, and thinks, oh, this sounds good. Have you got any kind of obvious tips that you can give for, for, for schools entering if they are interested at all? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the key thing is that it's about teamwork. So a third of the marks is about teamwork and a third of the marks is about math. So looking for people that do really work in teams is good if you're selecting your team from your school. But you can also go to the Enrich website, who we run the competition with, who are based at Cambridge University. 
So that's nrich.math.org. And there's um, a page on there all about the competition and top tips um, and how to practice for the competition as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I think it's great. I really do encourage any listeners, if they have an interest in this, to, to get involved. It sounds fantastic. I think it's just you know, such a, a fabulous thing to be encouraging young people in maths because I, I, you know, it's always really sad when I see that you know, people don't enjoy doing maths because, you know, Bobby, you're the man to ask about this, but it should be fun, shouldn't it? Absolutely. And I think the more you can show young people uh, the maths is almost like a game. I think young people love playing games, computer games. And if you just show maths is just another, you know, you've got a set of questions, you've got some ideas, and you're trying to plan a strategy on how to get through this particular problem. Um, it's just, if, yeah, if, it, if you can just bring the maths to life, it means that kids uh, just get so much more engaged. And then when they become young adults and adults, they've got this positive attitude and they spread that to all the people they know around them. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, thanks very much to both of you for coming on the show. Do appreciate your time this morning. I'd love really just to uh, just to sort of reiterate, if that's okay, a couple of points about um, where schools can go to enter. And, and also, I, I suppose, for any listeners, uh, just in general, to, to get a bit more information about the competition that you're running. I wonder if we could point listeners again in, in that direction online. Yep, definitely. So if you go to the Explore Learning website, which is explorelearning.co.uk forward slash young mathematicians, there's all the information on there about how to join into the competition. And um, if you want to look for some top tips and advice, you can go to the Enrich website, which is enrich.maths.org. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. And thanks, Bobby, as well. Now, I'd love actually just to, uh, well, I suppose just to just to head towards closing up, but I'd just love to give you, uh, I know this is a bit odd, but I'd just love to give you a song choice now, actually. I don't know if you have any favourite songs that I could just give a spin for you. And, you know, I, I'd just love to give my guests a song choice, basically. I think it's fair. <laughs> Oh, can you um, song with numbers? Mambo number five. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, that's excellent. Well, Charlotte, what about yourself? I mean, are you are you happy with that, or do you want to add another one into the mix? Um, totally... I mean, I would go for five, six, seven, eight by steps. <laughs> Especially like Fatal's on Strictly Come Dancing. Yeah. So, in fact, can I can I change my choice? I'm gonna <laughs> of course. Put my backing towards that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much to both of you. I do apologise for those jokes. They were terrible, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, but, I don't think I'll be inflicting them on my school. No. <laughs> Uh, possi- possibly not. That's what you get though if you Google rubbish maths jokes because yeah. that was my term. But anyway, <laughs> I'll let you both go. Thanks for chatting to us on Source and yeah, have a great rest of the day. Thanks both. Thanks, Sam. Here it goes. Time to get funky. <laughs> oh, oh, what? And I mean, what a request. Ha! Thanks, Bobby Siegel and Charlotte. That was fantastic. You know, all this talk about maths lessons at school has got me. Feeling young again, actually. Feeling a bit daft in the studio this morning. I just... <laughs> I can remember I actually got kicked out. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but I got kicked out of... Um, you know, I was doing all right for a little time. We had these, uh, you know, few sets in maths. And I was I was in the top set. I was like, yeah, yeah, buddy. Look at me. Real mathematician. But I got kicked out because... Well, okay, we had this little game where basically you had to do your... Oh, no, it is ridiculous, absolutely absurd. But I can we, we had this fant- absolutely fantastic teacher and absolutely nothing against this teacher. She was amazing, very Scottish indeed. And uh, I can remember, basically, we played this little game, me and my mate Gio. Uh, we ended up to get our, our work marked and we're trying to do the most stupid thing possible that she couldn't see, because obviously we were standing just, just kind of behind her, uh, that she couldn't see, but the, our, other, you know, the, our mate could see and then and laugh, and we'd laugh at each other. And my attempt at this game, I mean, I'm pretty sure I won the game, but I lost overall because I got booted out of the set. But here was my attempt. I basically did my tie down as low as I could, and I was kind of just waving it around a bit, like, you know, kind of like a little lasso thing. I, I thought it was awesome, a little dance anyway. And I didn't realise she was just watching me the whole time of this. And uh, I, I can remember her reaction, actually. It was, it was the perfect reaction. It was just, you stupid boy. And that was it. I was out of top set maths. That was my experience with maths. Um, I hope, <laughs> hope yours was better. No, I'm joking. It was, it was great. It was great. It was great fun. Um, anyway, you know what? I was just talking about um, yeah, feeling a bit daft. And it got me thinking about this. Anyone fancy playing bogeys with me this morning? Dick and Don won the show a while ago, actually chatting, uh, chatting a bit. And, you know, I didn't turn on the chance to play a bit of bogeys, of course. So here they are playing it, just in case you forgot about this. I'm afraid I'm going to have to get something out of my system. I think you probably know what that is. But oh, I thought if I, just, well, if I just do it straight off. Defense can be many things. I don't know what he's <laughs> <laughs> no, it's probably not. not it's not that bad. But I, I just, I'm just just gonna have to say it, guys. It probably happens all the time. But bogeys. Okay, there we go. I've, I've, oh, well, I've said it. I've said it. Very good. That was, that was, that was limp. 
more like a wet cabbage leaf. 8am <laughs> in the morning, Bogey. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say... very Cornish, by the way. Oh, oh, better cut it off there. <laughs> yeah, so that is, in fact, where the limp like a wet cabbage thing came from. That was limp like a wet cabbage. But that is probably enough of me being an idiot for now. Let's move on with the show, shall we? Well, thanks again to Bobby Siegel. Thanks to Charlotte. Uh, so that's two competitions we've heard from now for uh, young people. So make sure you do get involved if this is of any interest to you, or if, perhaps as well, if you know teachers, it's a great thing to perhaps let them know about this. But first of all, of course, we had Dr. Barry Fitzgerald talking about the Young Imagineers competition open between those between the ages of 7 and 14. Very simply, you have to come up with an idea to help save the world and send it in. Just Google Young Imagineers, you'll find that. Or listen back to the interview with Dr. Barry Fitzgerald. This interview will be available, of course, on Catch Up on the Source website very soon indeed. So you can catch it there again. And, of course, we've just heard from Bobby and Charlotte now talking about their National Young Mathematicians of the Year competition open to schools, open to groups. And we're going to move on now because I'd love now to invite to the show Professor Dave Hoskin again, our returning professor, our resident professor. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. You're back again. You know, I keep saying this, but I'm, I'm quite shocked that he hasn't run away yet because, anyway, he's very very good about it. He always comes on when I ask him. That's awesome. Getting him again uh, in a couple of weeks as well, alongside Sasha. So if you're pleased, Prof. Sasha Dahl is going to be back again as well. But this week, he's actually answering a question sent in by you, the good people of Cornwall. So you sent in a couple of questions. I chose one to uh, put to Dave. And this is a, a fantastic question. How do scientists observe evolution? So how do we know evolution is actually occurring? Can we see it happening? Dave is going to answer all. I do also get this week's silly question to him. Dave handles it well like a pro. I think he was a bit, you know, I think he was a bit nervous when I first said silly question, but he was all right. We also get his song request on, which is awesome as always as well. So don't you worry. But for now, that's enough chat from me because it's time for Professor Dave Hoskin. Hope you enjoy this, guys. Thursday breakfast on Source FM. But yeah, this is essentially one of these questions, a question that I've received from a listener a while ago, and I really wanted to address this with you now. Um, a couple of related questions, actually. We'll start with the, with the first one on the list for today, and we'll see where we go, I guess. No worries, and I have warned you that there was a daft question. Yes. We'll see, we'll see yes. what happens about that. Okay. And advance warning of the song request as well. Yes. Just to kind of keep you a bit stressed. Oh my God, yes, yeah, thank you right? very much. You're fantastic. <laughs> so the first question really comes down to, I suppose, more kind of practicing science, and that really is... How, so we're thinking about evolution here. How do scientists actually observe evolution happening in the lab? Um, it depends on the organism that you're working with, but it gets back to the question of actually what is evolution? And you can think about what evolution is in a number of different ways. If you think about evolution as being phenotypic change, um, you can do experimental evolution in the lab where you set up populations under different conditions and you allow them to replicate under those conditions and then you compare the differences at the end of some time period. So we've done that, for example, um, we studied the evolution of testis size, which sounds slightly obscure, but there's good reason for it. Um, and we had conditions where we evolved flies with or without sperm competition. And then at the end of a period of time, I think it was 12 generations, um, which in you know fly terms is a, is about a year, but obviously for us uh, it's a, you know it's quite a bit longer, a couple of hundred years for us, 12 generations. And then at the end of 12 generations, we then compared testicular size of flies growing up, evolving under conditions of sperm competition, to those with flies um, evolving with no sperm competition, and we found a that sperm competition actually selects on testis size. So when sperm are competing, one of the ways they compete is numerically. So it's a little bit like buying tickets in lotto. The more tickets you buy, the more chance you've got of winning, and that's what males are effectively doing. To have more tickets, more sperm, you need to have bigger machines to build them, and uh, testes are the machines that build it. So you can do that sort of thing quite simply. We've done other things where we've set up experimental populations where we followed single genes. So you set up experimental populations, uh, introduce a gene at, at some frequency, and then track its spread or decline through a population. And we did that with a DDT resistance gene. 
that has these really bizarre effects where it uh, turns females into super females in the absence of DDT. So it's, an, it's a, a gene that confers resistance to pesticides. But in the absence of the pesticides, it makes females these super fecund, super fertile. You know, they produce lots and lots of eggs. Their offspring survive really well. But at the same time, it makes males crap. And so we set up populations where we introduce the, the um, allele, the gene, and look to see uh, what happened. If you introduce it at low frequencies, it increases a bit through the female effect, and then it stabilizes and, and doesn't go any higher because of the male effect. If we introduce it at high frequency, it collapses because of the male effect and then stabilizes because of the female effect. So. There's lots of different ways you can do it depending on what your question is. But effectively what you're doing is tracking the thing that you're interested in over time. And in the laboratory, if we choose the right study organism, um, we can get through tens to tens of thousands of generations per year. Um, and so the most famous study that I know of is by a guy called Rich Lensky. He's been evolving bacteria under different conditions and he's gone through hundreds of thousands of generations. Well, that might be a lot. It might be 30,000 generations. Um, that's a long time um, in human terms. 30,000 generations takes us back, you know, it'd be getting uh, hundreds and thousands of years back. It, it might even be getting close to... Um, the split um, between the ancestor of chimpanzees and, and our uh, ancestors. It might be getting that far back. I'd have to think about it a bit. But, yeah, you can do those things. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. I think you know, one of the reasons which uh, you know, I thought this was a particularly good one to, ex to explore with you, really, is because you know, I think if people start to think about you know, the fact that scientists do routinely observe evolution you know, in, in controlled environments, like the lab, as, yep. as you were saying... Um, I mean, it, it kind of makes evolution no different to me to anything else that someone might choose to study. I mean, I, I know I'm kind of coming back to these kind of you know these misunderstandings. We addressed this a while yeah. ago, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the problems that we kind of identified was you know how to imagine those timescales. Yeah. The huge timescales that are required. Yeah. And of course, this comes back to why we use microbes in the first place, isn't it? As simple as yeah. short generation time. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. why they're used in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know the. Some of these sort of bacteria or, or microorganisms, um, they can replicate every couple of hours. So they can have babies every couple of hours, and then they have babies. They, they, rah, 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 rah. you know, my flies that I work on currently have a two-week generation time. So you know, uh, born, mature, copulate, lay eggs. Two weeks later, you're at the next generation, and that's pretty good. So you can get through lots. Um, but the principles for a fly, for a bacteria, for an elephant, for a human, they're all exactly the same. Sure. Um, and so, in a sense, what you're doing by conducting experimental evolution in the lab is using your, your model, your fly, your bacteria, as a very sophisticated kind of model to see how... Uh, to understand how things work. And it's like uh, using a mathematical model, except there's a lot more detail in your real model, um, that is your biological model, your fly or your bacteria. Um, but they are a wonderful, wonderful way of um, interrogating um, potential selective agents and what they might impact uh, on, uh, they're a wonderful way for interrogating evolution. So yeah, it's it's really quite good fun. And we've done all sorts. We've um, I, I can't think of the number of different studies that we've done, but certainly a lot. And experimental evolution is where you set up environments that differ in some way and observe what the outcome is. And environments might be social environments. It's not just temperature or rainfall or something. It could be you know, do you live with relatives or do you live with non-relatives? Those sorts of things. Um, but you can also directly select on traits. So uh, you can decide, okay, I want to make an insect with really long legs 
or an X, whatever it is, with really long legs, and test to see what selecting on that particular element of the phenotype, that particular element of the animal, what effects that has on other stuff. Um, normally you have an idea in mind, so it's not just some sort of arbitrary thing. Oh, far out. You know, I had a couple of glasses of wine on Friday night with my dinner and I've decided that I'm going to select on an antenna. You know, normally there's some mad reason behind it. Um, and it might be something as simple as, you know, do the genes for leg length affect the genes for memory? Sure. Right? Um, and there will be a rationale behind that too. Um, but you can directly select on things. And in a sense, what that's doing is replicating in the lab in real time in front of you what we've done with livestock, what we've yeah, done with sure. our pets, right? Because uh, dogs, as an example, dog breeds look really, really different from each other. They're all derived from wolves. Um, wolves were domesticated not that long ago in evolutionary terms. Um, and we've been able to generate this massive diversity because we like dogs with flat faces or we like dogs with tails that stick up or we like, you know, dogs with curly hair. Um, and that sort of directly selecting on characteristics that you like are the same sorts of things that we can do in the lab. And again, this might sound slightly weird, but it's trying to understand a highly variable trait. We selected on sperm size, the length of sperm, again in a fly, uh, to try and then understand what the selective advantages of having smaller or larger sperm are. So you select on the trait, you get an evolutionary response, you diverge your, your populations, so we can have a population now that's got really big sperm, a population that's got really small sperm, and then we can start to to look at the advantages and disadvantages of having those different size characters. Fantastic. You know, a related um, area that listeners might be interested in, of course, and we'll re-air this, is your um, discussion about sexual selection as yep. well, of course, yep. because, you know, that's going to trace them. Uh, made me think of that area as well, so that yeah, might right. be interesting for the audience to catch up with. And I'm just thinking one uh, one more area which I'll mention, and perhaps we'll, we we could we could think about um, you know moving on to the, to the other question, perhaps. Uh, and that is, I'm sure um, and, you know a lot of people listening now. We've been talking a bit about microbes, and so I to bring back microbes again. It might sound like a bit of a microbe fanatic, but I'm sure one thing sprung to their mind, and that might be um, you know, antibiotic resistance. Thinking about yep. watching these trait changes occur in yep. in real time, and of course that's something that people might be a bit concerned about. Yeah, it's really interesting because some people... Um, the evolution of bacterial resistance is a huge, huge problem. And as soon as you understand the most fundamental elements of evolutionary biology, you completely understand why um, we've seen the evolution of resistance because the speed of evolution partly depends upon the strength of selection and we're imposing really, really strong selection on microbes. So we should see, all else being equal, we should see a really rapid response, and we have. What's interesting is when the evolution of, of uh, uh, antibiotic resistance is discussed in the media generally, they don't use the evolution word. They use another E word. They say emerged. Yes. Like it's some <laughs> magical property. It's evolution and we should always refer to it as evolution. Um, what's really interesting for me is that uh, sort of microevolution, the stuff that we can see in real time in front of us, and that has all sorts of consequences, one of which you just, you know, is this, this bacterial resistance, um, is seen somehow as being fundamentally different from macroevolution. And that's a way some people rescue themselves from the dilemma of, uh, you know, there was some supernatural creation event that generated life on Earth uh, in all its forms and all its beauty, um, but we see these little changes happening within species. Um, it's a very strange disconnect for me. Um, people say, oh, well, you don't, you know, you've not seen speciation in the lab. Well, in fact, you can create speciation in the lab if you want to. And in fact, uh, you you know we've seen um, very simple experiments done that show 
effective speciation. And in fact, we've witnessed it in the wild with, for example, Ragoletus flies in the United States. When we introduced apples there, uh, they had a crab apple host that was the original host. We've t- taken over apples and we've seen a population, a single population diverge to match the two hosts and never the twain shall meet. So we can see these things happening in front of us. Um, microevolution is no different from macroevolution in its principles. It's macroevolution is microevolution with a shed load of time. Sure. To end, yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if you had enough time in the lab and you know to track these changes, you were saying, of course you would see these things. Yep. I mean, they, why would you not? Almost. Yep. Like, well, and, and that goes back to Lenski. I just jotted down on a bit of paper roughly what thirty thousand generations of bacterial evolution is in human terms. It's six hundred thousand years. Um, you know, that is getting right back to when um, hominids. <laughs> Our, our immediate ancestors started to diverge or were diverging from uh, our great ape cousins um, or their progenitors really, isn't it? Um, so very, very, you know, very, very long time spans and um, it really does give you a nice window into this whole evolutionary process and what it looks like. So I think just to, um, just to begin to close up this particular question, um, I don't know if you have any advice on this, but I'd really like just to start thinking perhaps about any listeners tuned in who might think, oh, you know what, I'd really like to kind of start reading up a little bit and perhaps improve their you know, understanding and knowledge surrounding yep. evolution. Would you have an idea of where to start? Like, you know, I'm thinking perhaps you know, they're not necessarily enrolled on, on courses and things like that. Is there anything out there they can just straight away begin to have a read of? Yeah, the Dawkins, the selfish gene. Uh, really good, uh, simple, um, well, I think it's simple, introduction. Very easy read. He writes very, very well. And there's another fantastic book. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's called The Beak of the Finch. Jacob Weiner, I think, is the author, The Beak of the Finch. It's about Darwin's finches and the wonderful work of two of our great biologists, Rosemary and Peter Grant, working on a tiny little island uh, where these finches have undergone this adaptive radiation. They've speciated in a very close space and it's all about their work on those finches. I think it's, it's a, it might be a Pulitzer Prize winner, but they're two great places to start. Very, very good. Fantastic. Now, that's great for, think, for the audience to know. So if, if they are interested, yeah, that's fantastic. I'll follow up on, on, on those suggestions. I don't so, get any royalties from those books, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll add a little tag to the, to the show. Exactly. For <laughs> so, Adobe, are you ready? Are you ready for the silly question? Okay. Are you sure you're prepared? I'm not sure at all. Far away, Ben. I'm <laughs> okay. always nervous when you do this. <laughs> okay, well, here goes, here goes. It's very simple, actually. I quite like the question. It is very simply... If you were a shapeshifter, so you know you can turn into things, right? What single animal would you choose to transform, you know, into and back to yourself, and why? <laughs> oh my god! Um, would be a bat by any chance? No, no. Although it would be quite interesting to be a bat to understand how they see the world because they're using such different sensory systems to us. That would be kind of interesting. Uh, just from a oh gosh, what does the world look like when you use sound? That'd be kind of. I've always wondered cool. what dubstep would look like to a bat. I don't know, Ben. <laughs> you, you, this is something. But you, but you I don't even us. know what dubstep <laughs> means. Um, I don't. I don't know. I think it must. It must be amazing to be able to fly. Um, and you, you know, if you go walking around Cornwall and you, you got a nice wind and you're watching gulls, just soaring without flapping. I mean, that looks like it must be really, really good fun, and. It does look like they're kind of enjoying it, so that'd be pretty groovy. Um, so maybe that, maybe that, just to know what it's like to fly as naturally as it is for us to walk, that would be pretty darn groovy. Yeah, don't think anyone could argue with that one. No. I think that's a great one, nice one. And, and of course, here's, here's the kind of, we are equally daft, I suppose, but a bit kinder, and that very simply is your song choice. Oh, um, <laughs> Well, last time I I went back in time and I went to the Stooges, Um, this time I'm going to go a bit more modern. And I think, especially given the current political climate, 
Um, I'm going for LCD Sound Systems North American Scum. Fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, I think that'll go down an absolute treat. It's a great song. Nice one. We'll get that on. Thank you very much, Dave. Pleasure to have you back on the show. That was Professor Dave Hoskin, ladies and gents. And here's his request. Great stuff. Well, thanks again to Professor Dave Hoskin for joining us on the show today again. And thank you indeed to all of my very special guests today. I want to really, really thank everyone who's appeared uh, with me today. Thanks to Dr. Barry Fitzgerald, who we heard from at the beginning of the show. Superhero scientist. Fantastic. He's a researcher, an author. It's definitely worth checking out his books, Secrets of Superhero Science and The Secret Science of, Super- of Santa Claus. Sorry. Uh, and he was talking about the Young Imagineers competition, which is worth getting involved with. It's open uh, for those between the ages of 7 and 14. Come up with an idea to help save the world. Google Young Imagineers or listen back to his interview for more details on that. Thank you to uh, Mathematician uh, from University Challenge, you might know him from there. Bobby Seagull as well, uh, alongside Charlotte, the head of Curriculum at Explore Learning, chatting about their search for the National Young Mathematicians of the Year. Thank you indeed to Dr. Range. It was fantastic having Dr. Range on the show with us again. This is the second time he's joined us. How awesome is that? Dr. Range, thank you. He was uh, giving us an update on flu this morning. Thank you uh, again as well to Professor Dave Hoskin. And thank you as well to you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for tuning in. And I really hope you can join me again next Thursday from 7.30 until 9 o'clock here on Source.